Hello, for those who don't know me, I'm Brother Sean. And I'm a member of the Teo community of St. Francis, the fourth order of Franciscans, founded by St. Francis in 2008, from his tomb in Assisi. And as a group of ordinary men and women who have embraced a Father Mother God, they have come from their heart, where they have surrendered everything to love and to walking alongside each child of God as a prayer partner from their monastery without walls. <coughs> Excuse me. I would like to just discuss some thoughts from the heart in relation to the cosmic Christ and thoughts on the solitary life because several of our members have chosen to live the solitary life as hermits with no access whatsoever to the internet but whose main focus is being in service to love and honouring their heart. But first I would like to <clears throat> read a reflection from Matthew Fox's amazing little book. I call it The Powerhouse of Reawakening, but the title of the book is The Coming of the Cosmic Christ. And here he says, No wonder Hildegard can say that good work by humans makes the cosmic wheel go round, and that every human is a flowering orchid needing to give back the fruits of one's labour to the community as a gift. When one looks around the universe, one finds work everywhere, good work of birthing, midwifery, celebrating and being. Only among the two-legged species do we find that strange invention called unemployment. There is so much good work that needs to be done. How can we tolerate unemployment any longer? The cosmic Christ leads the way to full employment, to the task of creating work. The world is our soul, declares Meister Eckhart. And by this he means that we live in the world we create for ourselves. If we deserve better than what we have, we must birth it from our souls. <clears throat> and there is the challenge. We must birth it from our souls. As a monastic in the Teo community, it was my choice to choose the contemplative life. I'm in the world and I'm of it and I work full time in divine service. In fact, I work longer hours now than I ever did in mainstream employment as a senior nurse in palliative care. But you know what? I love what I do. Because there's a purpose for the work that I do. Because I'm fulfilled on every level in my mind, in my body, in my spirit. And I'm working for a fair employer whose terms of reference are by far superior to those of any employer I've worked for. And my job description, well, it's a blank sheet of paper because you're given a free hand. The time you start, the time you finish. Your meal breaks, your rest periods, your prayer times are up to you. So there's a, an encouragement from the very beginning to surrender yourself. And in that surrender, there's a reawakening to love. But allow me share with you some wonderful thoughts that I received from my dear sister Miriam in New Zealand. And it's called Thoughts in solitude. Living in solitude, silence and simplicity 
is the hallmark of the eremitical life. Solitude is setting oneself in an environment of separation from community, but especially community living. At its best, solitude brings with it a desired aloneness, but not loneliness. The aloneness begets a certain emptiness that lo leads to silence. And silence stills a listening heart in order to be penetrated by the Word of God. Simplicity empties oneself of distraction and separates one from worldly cares. With solitude, silence and simplicity, peace and unexpected joy follows when it is lived intentionally in the presence of God and the Cosmic Christ. This is a rare and uncommon vocation. It's a gift of grace given to a hermit. This gift of grace speaks of a lifestyle lived in the presence of God, seeking constant union with God in prayer. The hermit lives in the power of prayer, speaking to God or listening for God's voice. Each day can be punctuated by psalms and hymns of praise. And more importantly, thanksgiving. For that seems to have disappeared from the vocabulary of mankind in the modern world. Thanksgiving. Whether in the garden, at the computer, studying sacred scripture, or attending the sick, the hermit is all at prayer. The hermit's prayer encompasses all of creation and all peoples. The hermit is at the center of all that is sacred, that lives, moves and breathes. The hermit is part of the powerhouse of God's love, supporting and nurturing those who are working in society, in the world, but whose hearts are not of it. The hermit places him or herself at the heart of creation and their praise for the world. Hermits may appear to be living on the fringes of society, but because the hermit is truly living in the presence of God, he or she is not on the margin, but at the very centre of Christian existence. The separateness of the eremitical life is a challenge to many who would see this isolation as a wasted life. An opting out of society, not sharing the lives with others, lacking in discipleship, to further the kingdom of God. There is no attempt at evangelization nor any outward preaching of the word of God. Obviously no one enters a hermitage to preach. Yet the eremitical life speaks emphatically of the values of the Christian life. If the Christian life is about union with God, and continuing the mission of Christ, his preaching of the kingdom of God, then the eremitical life has a message for everyone, especially today, when so many of God's children have become despiritualized, desensitized to the needs of the marginalized. A secular may ask, how does the eremitical life have anything to do with me? A personal hermitage is a gift from God to the heart. It is not enforced, 
it's freely given and freely entertained. And one doesn't become a slave to it. It's a free choice. And though many are called to it, only a few can actually withstand it because of it being such a disciplined life. A personal challenge can arise because of lifestyle of the hermit may question so much of another's lifestyle. Lives can often be tainted by greed, accumulating wealth, seeking for success at any cost, worrying over security, or building up a good name or reputation. All this can be encouraged by the cultural media surrounding us. We can become caught in a web of modern technology that easily leads to isolation from the present moment. And that is true because sometimes I'm sat here at the computer and I can spend hours just working on documents for the Teo community. And how fast time passes one by. A time that could be spent in prayer rather than typing on a keyboard, sending emails out when many of them won't be even read. Challenging. The very question er eremitical life raises preach about Christian values. What is at the forefront of our lives? What are our priorities? Are they ultimately seeking God above all things, finding Christ in our sister and brother, ushering in a healing balm to alleviate their suffering from disease or injustice? Preaching the word of God always requires fidelity to the gospel and personal conversation. The eremitical life fulfills these criteria. As to the gospel, all of Christian life is about union with a loving God, a closeness, an affinity with God. When we learn of the hermit, hermit life, we find this way of living questions our own lifestyle. It shows us a call that brings into our midst a lively face, a selfless love that builds the kingdom of God within and without. After years in community life as a Trappist, Thomas Merton sought the eremitical life. Merton retired to a hermitage on the property of Gethsemane Abbey. He described the hermit life as the need to withdraw from the babble of confusion around us in order to listen more patiently to the voice of conscience and the Holy Spirit. He adds that the hermit's prayers and fidelities will renew the life of the church. The lifestyle of the hermit is one of radical self-offering, where one begins to lose oneself in the silent presence of a loving God. It is a rare gift not given to everyone, demanding wholeness of mind and spirit, so one can take up the works of eternal life. Thus, eremitical life preaches the kingdom of God already, begun in us and yet still awaiting us. Today, <clears throat> today, there is a contemplative within every child of God, and those who connect with the contemplative aspect of their being, discover that the humdrum babble of neighboring chatter is a distraction. So they want 
to seek a place where they can be still in the presence of God but not become a hermit. Like me, I live in a small village. I'm surrounded by people. But once I shut the gate to our monastery garden, I shut out the drama, the fear, the anxieties, the stressors. And as I walk towards our little house, I bring with me my peace of God. And the house reflects that peace because those who live in it and those who come to it are touched by that peace. The peace must come from within. We cannot expect a lorry load of peace to arrive at the monastery gate and say, Hello, brother. I've got a ton of peace for you. Peace must come from within. And for us to come to that place, we have much work to do. And often the best work is on our knees, asking God to help us, asking God to empower us, face our demons and our fears and not run away. But today many run away because they're afraid. They've been so badly wounded. And God is not going to wound us anymore. He's going to empower us to come to him as a loving Father, Mother, God and talk as I'm talking with you. Say it as it is. Spare the punches. Come direct to God. No flowery language. Speak your truth from love and you'll be amazed at what help can be given. But the cosmic Christ the Divine Feminine, the Company of Heaven are there with our spiritual teachers to assist us in nurturing a contemplative life, part contemplative, part active ministry. The story of Jesus with Mary and, and Martha, that's the two sisters of Lazarus, do you remember? Martha was the one rushing around, creating dust. I can be a bit like that sometimes. And Mary sat at the feet of the Master. But in the background, poor Martha was huffing and puffing. And it got so bad that Martha almost had a strop. And she said to Jesus, I wish you'd get off her backside and give us a hand. I'm here all on my own. Talk about being a drama queen. But Martha used to meet herself coming back. Martha wasn't happy unless she was having a good old bitch or moan, forgive the pun. But Jesus said to Martha, Mary has chosen the better part. And Martha looked shocked, possibly even angry. So what did Jesus mean that Mary had chosen the better part? that Mary had chosen to sit and to listen, to listen to the voice of spirit. And that's the beauty of being a member of the Teo community, where we embrace all faiths and none, without the baggage, the ritual, the structures, observing the law, the letter of the law, killing the spirit of the law, which is love. And the cosmic Christ today is calling the sons and daughters of God to live in the world, but not be of it. And to nurture part contemplative. In other words, when you come in from the office, the factory or the supermarket, and you close your door, then you can begin to live your contemplative life. Because you have the choice to watch telly and sit there wallowing in selfishness or self-pity, or to be more proactive and take responsibility for your spiritual life as you do your physical life. 
Now I'm not called to live the eremitical life as a hermit. But I know in my heart of hearts I love the peace and the quiet. When Brother Rob's great nieces and nephews depart, oh the peace. Even the little dogs, they know they've gone, they can relax. They're not on tender hooks like this. But there's a part of us inside ourselves that's like this because we're afraid to relax. We're afraid in case we feel guilty for relaxing. This was an awful trait in nursing, in general nursing. You were never encouraged to sit at the bedside of a very poorly patient, hold their hand and ask what was wrong. Oh no, if the ward sister seen you sat down, you'd get the riot act. General trained nurses, we were like eternal scrubbers. We were on the go 24 seven cleaning. Mind you, we didn't have MRSA like today, but you weren't encouraged to sit with a patient who was anxious. And society today has imposed that unfair imposition on us, where we've always got to be seen to be doing rather than unseen listening. I would ask you to come into your heart. I would ask you to be strong. And in listening to your heart, you will hear the inner voice of spirit. You will hear the voice of your God. But you're not going to hear the voice of God when the telly is full on, the radio is blasting, you have people coming and going, their mobiles are tingalinging. You need to have space. You need time for yourself. And that shouldn't evoke fear. It should instigate joy that you're coming home to the beloved that you're coming home to your true self, that you're coming home to the I am presence who lives within you. Francis of Assisi was not a hermit, but he did something greater. He combined part hermit with active life. As soon as he left his brothers to go to his cave, he became the hermit, the contemplative. It didn't last long because as a Franciscan, his ministry was to the marginalized and the poor in the world. So he led by example, but he also inspired his brothers and sisters that when they closed the door to their little cell or their room, there begins their journey of intimacy with God and if that's what you're searching for and you're wishing to be part of a community of men and women who do not discriminate on grounds of religion sexual orientation or disability even color but you want to live in the world but you also want to combine a spiritual life and have a sense of belonging in a community that's online and who meet four times a day if they're free for agape, for nourishment and support, then please feel free and join us. At least inquire. It won't cost you anything other than the stamp. Or go on the website and just type in Interfaith Franciscans. and just allow the Spirit of God to come upon you and guide you. It may not be for you, but I know it's for me, having lived an active life all my life as a professional nurse. Now I so love the peace and quiet, and when I go out for a walk into the woodlands to connect with Gaia and nature, it is wonderful until I see other people and then I think, oh, isn't there anywhere where I can be free without people? Not today, but
but I can be here. So coming back to this amazing book, The Coming of the Cosmic Christ, I'm going to read again Hildegard of Bingen's comments. No wonder Hildegard can say that good work by humans makes the cosmic wheel go around and that every human is a flowering orchid needing to give back the fruits of one's labor to a community as a gift. Thank you for watching. I hope it's been of some help. And I wish you all that you wish yourself. May God bless you. May God reward you in whatever you decide to do for your highest good. Namaste.